Kevin White, and I'm mm -hmm. the founder of Doing Good Foundation. I want to thank you all again for coming to Doing Good Week. Um, we have a great panel today um, of cannabis industry experts, um, and we're really happy, including in the nonprofit sector, and we're really happy to have them. Um, I just want to say that this is a panel discussion on cannabis donations, yes, no, or maybe. Um, it's presented by CanMakeADifference.org. Um, if you are a nonprofit, you can sign up with Can I Make a Difference to get connected with cannabis companies looking to partner with nonprofits. You can find out more at canmakeadifference.org slash nonprofits. Um, so what I'd like to do is go ahead and have the panel introduce themselves. Um, they will give you a little bit about themselves, a little bit about their company, and then we'll go ahead and just start with panel questions. So without further ado, we will start with Ken. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Well, on the board here, you're going to see, uh, oh, I see that. Uh, it's not on the board here. Well, I'll put it on the board here. <laughs> Uh, some credentials that I, uh, I won't go through in, uh, in total here, but let me just give you a basic uh, background sketch. My name is Ken Baraski. I'm with the Hoban Law Group. Uh, we are now in seven, I think it's 18 states, uh, and Puerto Rico, and now uh, internationally as well. Uh, my uh, area of focus is federal tax. Uh, my background is... Uh, uh, after law school uh, and uh, the LRM program, the master, uh, master's program at NYU. I was with the Department of Justice for a number of years and uh, litigating tax cases. And uh, while I didn't lose a whole lot of them, there is one that I'm very proud that I lost. It was involving the constitutionality of the Marijuana Tax Act. And uh, I was very pleased, I got to brief that before the Supreme Court, and bottom line is, uh, lost it wholeheartedly. Uh, so the Marijuana Tax Act was uh, declared unconstitutional, fortunately. When I left the Department of Justice, I went uh, with a Houston law firm and ended up here in, uh, in Denver. Uh, I uh, was a consultant to KPMG and to uh, Ernst & Young. Uh, for a number of years. Uh, uh, bottom line is, I've been in uh, Denver now for about a, about a year uh, and thoroughly enjoying the, uh, the tax practice. The focus here that I want to start out with uh, is the focus of something that everyone should be familiar with. And if they aren't familiar with it, they need to be. Uh, and that is Section 280E of the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, uh, let me dash back just a bit to uh, 1970. Uh, there was an act uh, called the Controlled Substances Act uh, that was passed uh, making the manufacture, the distribution, the possession, uh, all aspects of marijuana illegal at the federal level, and that continues today. Uh, uh, the reasons for that, I think, uh, have much less to do with uh, drug policy uh, and much more to do with uh, politics and power. And while that's outside the scope of, uh, of today, uh, I think it's an important emphasis that that really is where the, uh, where the turnkey lay uh, for uh, the legislation that created the Controlled Substances Act and then later, uh, 280E. Uh, 280E uh, was enacted in 1982. A lot of people don't know that. It's relatively recent. Uh, and its purpose was to reverse a tax court decision uh, that basically uh, you had a uh, guy who was dealing in heroin and, uh, and weed and a bunch of other things. Uh, and wanted to deduct his business expenses uh, for the venture. The tax court uh, kind of surprised everyone and said, uh, yeah, he can deduct those. 
uh, and almost immediately Congress responded by saying, uh, no, let's enact Section 280E uh, that says, uh, no, he's not going to get deductions for uh, trade or business expenses. And let me elaborate just a little bit on that. 280E basically says, and it's a, I'll skip here to uh, the slide that has the one sentence wonder of 280E. Uh, it basically says that you uh, don't get a deduction for your trade or business expenses. That's your labor, your rent, your utilities. You get no deduction for tax purposes for those. And the only thing, even though it's not in the statute itself, it's in the legislative history, the only thing that you can reduce your uh, gross receipts by is the cost of the product that you're selling, cost of goods sold. So cost of goods sold, yes. Trade or business expenses, uh, no. Uh, that has a very significant uh, impact on this industry. And the reason that it does, I'm going to skip uh, into an example of it, which I think is a quite demonstrative example. If you, uh, and I hope everyone can see that in the, in the lighting here, uh, if you have gross receipts of 500 bucks uh, and cost of goods sold of 100 bucks and trader business expenses of 300 bucks and a tax rate of 35%, let's see how that plays out. If you didn't have Section 280E, you would take your 500 bucks, you'd subtract the $100 that you paid for the stuff you're selling, the cost of goods sold and you'd subtract your trade or business expenses of 300 bucks, that would subtract out to 100 bucks of taxable income. And at a 35% rate, that would mean that you pay 35 bucks in tax and you end up with 65 bucks in your pocket. But if 280E applies, you start out with your $500 of gross receipts, you subtract your cost of goods sold of $100, that's the only reduction of gross receipts that you get. That leaves $400 of taxable income. And if you compute the tax at 35%, that's $140 in tax. Well, if your taxable income is uh, $400 uh, and you're paying $140 in tax, uh, you have not been able to deduct your $300 of trader business expenses. And so bottom line is, you're ending up with $40 of loss by paying your taxes if 280E applies. Uh, that's quite dramatic from $65 worth of putting that in your pocket to $45 or $40 uh, out of pocket uh, in order to conduct the business a total loss. That's why 280E is so important in this industry. And we get down to some very fine distinctions. Uh, one of the things that's allowed uh, is that uh, storage costs for the product that you're, that you're marketing. Uh, let's say you have a display case. Display case is glass and underneath the, uh, the top portion is where you're displaying the products that are actually for sale. The bottom of that cabinet, uh, again, faced with glass, is all of your product that you have in storage that you draw from in order to, in order to sell. Question is whether that qualifies as a storage uh, and therefore a deductible expense. And the answer is no. Uh, and the reason is because the fact that it's glass means that it has a marketing aspect to it as well. And because it has a marketing aspect, a sales aspect, pulls it out of the category of storage and you lose the deduction. So what do you do? You got the storage case of glass, you got all your stuff in it. You could take a piece of cardboard and cover the, uh, the glass so that no one can see in the bottom portion and poof, magic it's now deductible. Uh, you could paint the glass black if you wanted to. But the distinction and the important thing here 
is that these kinds of minute decisions are what really affect your bottom line uh, in the uh, cannabis business. Uh, and it's little things like that. If you watch the pennies, the dollars will take care of themselves. Uh, that's a very important penny. Now, I wanted just to lay a foundation uh, for uh, 280E here for those who aren't familiar with it. Uh, because, uh, as I started out, I think it's one of the most, the most important considerations in the cannabis arena. Even though it's illegal uh, at the federal level, it sure hasn't stopped the IRS from enforcing uh, the taxing provisions on it. And at this difference in rate, you can end up, instead of paying 35% uh, of what your uh, uh, income is, you can end up paying somewhere between 85 and 90 percent uh, of what your income is. The margins become very, very small. Uh, with that in mind, uh, I'm going to defer to uh, others in the panel here to begin the discussion on the uh, nonprofit aspects, uh, which, by the way, is nonprofit under state law, uh, but not under federal law. Uh, and while we do have some inroads occurring now, uh, very recently, uh, inroads like, uh, oh gee, there is, uh, we now have a, uh, an international church of cannabis in, uh, in Denver. Uh, the original church of cannabis, which is not related to this one, was in uh, Indiana uh, as a uh, 501c3 organization. Very important uh, that these inroads are now being made. I think they're in like four states now, uh, might even be five states, uh, as 501 c 3 organizations. And interestingly, uh, they came in uh, because of, the one in Indiana particularly, because of uh, the legislation that was passed uh, to discriminate uh, in favor of religious institutions so that they could exclude uh, people that they didn't want to uh, participate in their religious institution. That has been turned on its head and used as the reason uh, for making uh, the church uh, under the religious freedom, uh, making the church a 501c3 uh, organized around cannabis. Uh, there are a lot of things like this happening, a lot of anomalies, uh, and uh, when you start talking about nonprofits, uh, it is riddled with questions like this. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of that kind of, uh, of action. So again, I'll defer at this stage and come back at a point uh, when it becomes more relevant to the uh, tax aspects of, uh, of nonprofits. Thank you. Cannabis companies have very thin margins. So when it comes to, um, and they're taxed at an effective rate of about 75%. So when it comes to donations, people wonder, well, why aren't, you know, why aren't we seeing more cannabis donations coming into the nonprofit sector? There's a, a lot of reasons, and we'll get to that here in a second. Um, but one of the main reasons is, is that they don't get a tax deduction for making a donation. So the, the challenge of that also relates into the nonprofit sector where nonprofits don't even know if they can accept it because they won't be writing a receipt for it for the IRS in order to make that happen. So there's a lot of questions and I'm hoping that this panel, which I'm sure they will, will um, share a lot about what they're doing um, to engage in their community engagement and corporate social responsibility. So without further ado, I'm just gonna have, um, turn it over to Bobby, have him introduce himself, Todd and Michelle to introduce yourselves and then we will get right into a couple questions. Bobby. Hi there. You can stand up, that's oh, fine. Sweet, I was like, <laughs> am I podium? Or? Yeah, we'll just stay in your place, um, and we'll, uh, but you can stand up. If you'd like. Thanks. I'm Bobby Reginelli. I'm the marketing director for Euflora. We are a group of boutique cannabis dispensaries here in Denver. A little bit of company history real brief. We started in 2013. On the 16th Street Mall, we were able to procure a spot that was underground. So we're next to 7-Eleven on Tremont 16th. We had to be off the mall, not visible, because 
they were very, very threatened that we could even find a place that would work. So we ended up having to go to landlord's house and, you know, plea with him to get the space originally. Um, some pretty remarkable things that we have to do to get the store open. Uh, I was with the company in 2014 when we opened, and as I'm sure you can imagine, it was pandemonium in the beginning. It was, you know, with millions of tourists that walked down the 16th Street Mall, we knew that if we could get the store open, it would be, uh, it would be an absolute phenomena, and it has been since then. Um, we opened on April 1st, 2014, and um, I guess our company has had uh, very big success in the beginning. Being first to market is very important, so if I wanted to start a cannabis dispensary nowadays, this is a 10 and 15 million dollar affair. People know what it's worth, the licenses are limited, even in new states, it's very, very expensive to make any sort of um, horizontal growth within when, once you have your first store established. But Euflora was able to set up three more stores. We have two stores in Aurora, which only the city only issued 24 total licenses. And we also have another store that we purchased on 43rd and Brighton Boulevard in the Rhino Art District. Um, I deal with marketing and the challenges are they're they're extreme i don't think any company operates how we have to so i deal with yelp yelp will offer reviews for you flora yelp usually wants you to buy advertising but we can't buy advertising there's no way that you flora is allowed to actually make a purchase from a company that is a 50 states company or an international company because they don't want to take the risk on doing something in Colorado that will jeopardize their business elsewhere. Likewise, Facebook, Instagram, any social networks that I interact with, we're not allowed to promote anything. We can't boost posts. There's no advertising that I can do via Google. And so for me, when I came on, I decided that it would be beneficial for us to be the first movers in whatever ways we could to kind of get into spaces where we could have an advantage of doing something before the rest of our competition does. And Kevin and I are working on a joint partnership now with the Doing Good Foundation and Can It Make a Difference where they're going to actually be the liaison to help me find charitable partners. There are very few charities that I as a dispensary can interact with where it feels like a true partnership. And what I mean by that is at Euflora, what we're doing now is something called Social Saturday. And every Saturday we are giving 2.5% of our purchasing of that day, of the sales of that day, to a charity of our choosing. That charity in exchange comes to the store, sets up a booth and a display, and promotes themselves while at the same time promoting that, yes, we are proud to be partnered with a cannabis company. Euflora gets no tax benefits for this arrangement. This is simply giving for the sake of giving. If there's anything that we get from this relationship, it is the chance to be a mover and a shaker in the beginning of this and tie in charities in a sort of rising tide lifts all ships. We really, really value the partnership aspect of this and the fact that they're talking about us and we're talking about them and everybody's talking about it on social and I'm able to organically get a grassroots sort of a swell from our interaction at the same time we get to do real sustainable good and a great example of some recent success that we had one of the few companies that's you know they are cannabis specific charity they started after legalization and they embrace cannabis in a way that a lot of other charities that we would love to support don't because they were existing before legalization in Colorado. We partnered with Grow for Vets. And Grow for Vets is a 501c3. They have multiple chapters around the country. And their mission is to stop the hundred and some odd opioid overdose deaths. I think he said 50 of them were vets. So 50 some odd overdose deaths of vets are happening every day and their goal is to turn that around by providing growing knowledge, access to subsidized cannabis, and in some cases outright charity given cannabis for, directly from their organization to veterans in need. And they throw events in Las Vegas and in California and here in Colorado. And we were able to partner with them last month and the, the reaction was just electric. 
vets coming in and connecting with this organization, people who are married into families that have vets, um, to be able to see the power of cannabis as a healing, uh, as a healing agent, the ability of us as a company in cannabis, as a sort of, we would almost be like the medium through which money can be generated via selling cannabis f to support this organization. And then um, we get the organization together, we print up a big check, and we make a little bit of an online hoopla, Facebook Live videos and things like that, of us passing the check onto this organization and the vets standing around receiving you know, the charitable giving that we're trying to be a part of. It, it's really remarkable that we can't do more of this. But what little we can do, we're really excited about working with an organization like Grow for Vets because they embraced us on the same level that we were embracing their organization. And so many calls that I make and so many organizations that I would like to partner with, they are unable to take money from us especially if they receive federal money. If they receive federal money, it is an absolute deal breaker. It's game over. And I've talked to chairmen and, and different people on the boards of different charitable organizations. They want to do this. I mean, 3% of sales from four different stores in Colorado is a substantial giving month to month. And so it's never a question of will this be worth their time. It's absolutely worth their time. But can they do it? If they receive federal money, they cannot. If they receive money from somebody who's out of state but it's private, there are strings there too. If they try to, if they try to go around and maybe just do it locally but keep it hush hush, it ends up not being a great partnership for us because we want a 50-50 win-win, you know, a mutually, uh, a mutually beneficial sort of an arrangement. And man, happy to know this man and happy that he's supercharged about bridging the gap. I, I, I'm doing marketing. I do not have time to call 50 charities a month to try to rotate a charity every month. It, it's, it's an enormous undertaking. And I'm really excited to partner with Kevin's foundations, both of them, uh, to move the ball forward. And um, thank you all for being here. I appreciate your concern for this issue. I'm representing the Green Solution. We have about, uh, well, we have 12 stores, 658 employees in Colorado. We'll have 15 stores by Q1 of next year. Um, so I manage all the government affairs, community outreach for the company. So the question is, what does that mean? Is that lobbying? Is it just trying to motivate our agenda? And the answer is, it's a little bit of all of it. But as it pertains to charitable organizations, one of the things that I do every day is is work to figure out how we can authentically enter into a community. I think this is part of the challenge we have in the charitable world is that a lot of times people will come in, they don't really have an authentic connection to that charity, so they're coming in, whether it's for the tax benefit or just for the marketing uh, or things like that, and then it has an inauthenticity to it, which actually I think damages the relationship. So one of the things we really focus on is First of all, we have 658 employees, so going to them first and finding out what they care about. And then we are able to go and be a part of those um, organizations, both in money, but we also volunteer our people a lot, which is really important. I think that's a, I've, I've been a part of charities before, and it's always a real challenge to get enough people involved as well. So it's not always about money. The marijuana industry can work with you when it comes to people, when it comes to cross-promotion in that way. Um, and there are some loopholes in Denver as well. So. Um, we were actually just about to sponsor the AIDS walk and it was going to be a $75,000 sponsor. We ran into a brick wall with the city of Denver. The city of Denver said, absolutely not, you can't do that. And we said, why not? You, we're, it is in the state law and it is in, even in Denver's law that we can sponsor these events. But you can only sponsor those events if they're seen as a small sponsor. In other words, if you are going to be the title sponsor for $75,000 with your green solution name on the big logo right in front of the big... Uh, area where everyone comes in the main entrance that's considered a breach of both state and city law because now it is in the purview of children um, and so you have to be very careful about that now the irony of that is here's an organization that was willing to give the top spot donation amount of seventy five thousand dollars and all they wanted to do was be able to put their name in in the marketing aspect of the event 
So, so what we found is, and I'm, I'm sure Euphora has done this as well, we found ways around that. So now, and this is something for all of you to keep in mind, if you're having an indoor event, like a dinner or a gala or a fundraising event, marijuana companies can sponsor that all day long. They can have their logo everywhere, providing that it's, it doesn't have over 30% of children inside the event. So, so we can now be a part of those events. What I can also tell you on the positive is that if you engage with a marijuana company, uh, it is not like, and I've heard this in the news, is it like engaging with an alcohol company or with a tobacco company or something? And it's completely different. This is a, an, or, uh, an industry that believes this is a privilege. So they do nothing, that, and matter of fact, go way out of their way to make sure nothing they do, if they're part of your event, is seen as controversial or as them marketing to kids or, or trying to motivate children into the industry, none of that is accurate. So if you've heard that before, it is simply not true. Um, you have to, you, there are lots of ways you can work with companies like ours and like you, Flora, and others. Um, and there are lots of little loopholes that we can talk about as well that we've found that are beautiful. We just joined the Lodo Business District. Um, so there's some marketing we can do. We can't be in their app, which is national, but we can be in their local app, which is local. Um, and then we also, um, for the first time, signed a, a good neighbor agreement with the Lodo Business District and the GNO there to say that we're going to also go above and beyond in community outreach and we're working to build playgrounds and different parks. So there's a lot of stuff the industry can and does do. And I'm happy to talk about all of it. I'm a nonprofit. Um, I represent uh, the 501c3 Nonprofit Impact Network. Um, I founded it in 2013, Los Angeles, and then br brought it over here to Colorado um, because it's a much more welcoming state uh, for the work that we do. Um, and uh, the work that we do is actually trying to figure out how women that want to use cannabis can use it best for their medical condition. So for example, if you're a woman with stage four breast cancer and you found out about cannabis through someone, what do you do? What doctor do you see? What dispensary do you go to? What dosages do you take? We'd love to say that all the dispensaries know how to treat patients, but we just don't have the data yet. So I'm a neuroscientist. I run a team of amazing scientists um, that have built together um, some clinical studies, and we've been trying to fundraise for these studies for so long. Um, and we've come across the issue where if you're trying to raise, you know, several hundred thousand dollars for legitimate research um, that can be published in peer-reviewed journals, well, you can't get the funding from the federal government. You can't get the funding from your state governments because they usually fund the research that shows that cannabis is bad, not that cannabis can actually help treat cancer. Um, as you can see, like there's very few cancer studies that are happening in the United States. Most of them are happening in Israel and other countries. Um, but here in Colorado, it's basically an over-the-counter drug. I mean, any adult can go into a dispensary and purchase something. And so I came from the nutraceutical space. And so we don't understand why you can't just study this like you would like a nutraceutical, like you would like vitamin D or something you pick up at any pharmacy. And so our goal really is to be able to find both mainstream partners and cannabis partners um, to be able to take um, this research, take this education, and to make sure that no matter where you are, if you're a woman, you can understand how to use this product um, before it's too late. I mean, that's the worst, is that we get patients that are saying, okay, well, I have stage four, I have like two more weeks to live, like, can this cannabis oil that I picked out from somewhere help? And you're like, you know, it's too late sometimes. And so we are uh, we definitely accept cannabis donations. We do everything from private galas to walks. It's interesting now that the marketing um, laws has changed. So we used to put on family friendly events where mothers could bring their kids and they would like go color in the corner and stuff. And now we have to worry about getting cannabis sponsorships and um, dealing with those laws. Clearly we're not marketing the cannabis for the children. We're marketing it for their sick mothers. But you know, this is you know, the, legal, the legal framework that we're working in. Um, but for us, it has been a challenge to find the funding um, in, a, in a very challenging environment, but we have been sort of the leaders to market, teaching other groups how to make uh, mainstream and cannabis partnerships and move forward. And we really think of ourselves as like the Susan G. Komen for cannabis. So um, it's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to know that so many of us are working really hard uh, to change uh, this world for the better. I just want to point out that the Doing Good Foundation, we openly accept uh, money from the cannabis industry. And one of the main reasons we do that is to bring to light the possibilities that the cannabis 
industry can bring to the nonprofit sector purely because they're doing it altruistically. They're not receiving the tax deductible donation. They're already taxed, like we said, at 75%. So we just want to reach out and make that happen for the industry because we know as an organization that is dedicated to helping small nonprofits, we know that if we can bring to light more to the general public the challenges of linking nonprofits to the cannabis industry, that we can develop more partnerships between the cannabis industry and nonprofits and ultimately bring more money into the nonprofit sector. So that's why we're dedicated to this, and that's why we're a part of this, and that's why we bring people together to talk about this. Do you believe that there's still a stigma um, or public image problem with the industry? And if so, do you think partnerships with nonprofits can assist um, in your company's public image and the public image, image of the industry as a whole? Yeah, I think it's interesting. There is a, there's far less of a stigma today culturally than there was in 2014, certainly when it started uh, as far as legalization occurs here. I, I, think, I think it does, you make an interesting point though, that it does give us all a really interesting opportunity to demonstrate what the marijuana industry is capable of on the positive side. So if I were partnering with a nonprofit, let's say it's you know, an AIDS walk or something, if I could, um, it's a really, it's a good opportunity for us to not only demonstrate that we're good corporate citizens and we're out there supporting the community, but also it, it starts to crush the stereotypes, right? So, so I know for me, if I walk into a congressman's office and I'm wearing a suit, I automatically change their positioning on the entire industry because they expect me to come in, you know, uh, with a, you know, I don't know, whatever their stereotype is. <laughs> I'm not going to go there, but uh, but I think the point is that they expect something they're not getting, and so it. I mean, I've had, I've had, you know, hardcore Republicans go on a tour of a facility and suddenly their minds change. So um, it doesn't mean they're advocates; it just means they soften. So I think there's an opportunity for us with nonprofits to say. Hey, we're going to come in, and that's why I said you've really got to, the industry, if they're listening, really needs to pay attention to how they enter into that partnership. Because it's not just the marijuana industry reputation, that's one element, but we can take those knocks of reputation. A nonprofit cannot. It cannot afford a reputational risk. So, you know, I would ask nonprofits to be very careful about which organizations that you that you partner with and make sure you really take your time with that you know you don't want to for example have a nonprofit that's for farmers or something and then at the same time your cannabis operator was a heavy pesticide abuser and had products seized and so you want to be careful that reputationally you're doing that work as well that's that's best advice there but I think it's a win-win for for both the industry and nonprofit if you have the right partnership if I could add a comment to this, and I absolutely agree, I think things are changing and changing for the better uh, uh, by encouraging the interaction with, with nonprofits. But an analogous situation which brings out that point is what's happened with the banking industry, a very conservative industry. Uh, initially, it was uh, don't ask, don't tell. If money was coming from a weed operation, uh, technically that's money laundering. But if you don't ask, you don't have to worry about it. So bottom line is banks were taking in dollars without asking what is the source of those dollars. Uh, what happened, though, is that as the industry progressed, uh, more and more dollars were coming into the bank. And instead of don't ask, don't tell, it became don't ask, don't smell, because these dollars had a distinct smell of, of weed. <laughs> and there's only so much a bank can take before the bank starts smelling like weed. And then you've got problems with the other customers and blah, 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 all kinds of, uh, of difficulties. Uh, well, the banks had a solution to that, uh, and that, or some of the banks have, some have not. Uh, the banks that have uh, now charge somewhere between oh, $3,500 to $5,500 a month of a service fee, taking the risk of uh, money laundering aspects of, uh, of these dollars coming in. And what that shows is a much more liberal and gradually changing environment. That's exactly what's happening in the, in the nonprofits. Uh, instead of backing off uh, from anything to do with the, uh, with the weed industry, uh, inroads are being made and they're very positive. And my gosh, the benefits that go to, uh, to the people being served 
uh, with the PTSD and uh, you know the opioid addiction and all of this stuff, nonprofits can play a very important role there. And I'm very pleased to see the change. So just wanted to make that comment as an analogous situation with the banking industry. I'll chime in real quick. Uh, I think it's it, it further highlights uh, the benefits of being a first mover. It's 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 an exciting time. It's a little bit nerve wracking time, but it's an exciting time to be a charity that's willing to partner with one of our companies. It's an exciting time for Colorado to lead the way in developing the model on how charities and cannabis companies work together. There is absolutely no stigma about working with a brewery, even if it's a children's charity. Um, you know, we have to be careful not to be seen supporting children, and we have to be careful not to be seen uh, even getting close to that line as much as we would love to. We were approached by a charity the other day and they, they raised money to purchase bicycles for kids. Man, I'd love to get on board with that. But we just cannot bridge that gap at this point. However, there are a lot of charities that we can, we can kind of get into a partnership with that if they're willing to step out a little bit, we're willing to step out a little bit. And as TGS knows and as Euflora knows, companies have been, been around since the beginning. We're not afraid to take a risk if we, if we truly believe in the healing benefits of cannabis, if we believe in the charity that we're helping out with, if we believe that giving for the sake of giving is the thing to do, which we always are on board with that. It, as an industry, first movers are rewarded. As companies, we've been rewarded for being first. Now, like I said, it is financially very difficult to expand in this business. Um, so, you know, we, we, we've sort of occupied a boutique niche and we will continue to grow at organically as we can. But we want the partnerships with charities to not be bound by stigma. And of course, there is a little bit there, as you mentioned. But at this point, when California comes online in January with 38 million people able to consume cannabis, stigma is going to be the one thing that kept us from moving. Because once that snowball starts rolling, I just I don't see any end in sight. So I think stigma is going to hold us back when we need to be brave leaders right now. And, and I'm a Colorado native. I would love to see our state lay the groundwork for how this looks going forward. Michelle, anything on that? <laughs> Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of great groups and, you know, um, definitely um, with what Kevin's doing, we'll be able to harness all that. There's a lot of, you know, oh, faces that we can get from veterans, from moms, um, from, you know, sick women that can really change what this looks mm -hmm. like. And then giving back to the communities, too. It's, it's just fantastic. So, great. What do you currently do or plan to do within the realm of corporate social responsibility? We are doing quite a bit. We're, we started out with neighborhoods. That was really... When I came on board, the first, the first thing I said was that we have to start looking at the community as a community of people who both understand and don't understand, and so we need to go in level. No stigma, uh, and because actually what was happening in the industry, in my opinion, the last couple of years was that there was almost this reverse stigma, where the industry sort of felt like, I'm coming into a room like this, I can guarantee five of you hate me, and we're going to have this horrible debate, and we're going to argue about civil liberties, and here we go. And instead, what happened was we found that a lot more people were more curious. And so my mission was to go into neighborhoods and do town halls and start to talk to the community and talk to community organizers and nonprofits and say, we're here to stomp out the stigma, so anything you feel negatively about it, I'm going to answer those questions. And by the way, sometimes it's uncomfortable, because you get into, I've been... I've sat in board meetings with, with nonprofits where I'll have half the room is on board, they're excited, they see a check for $20,000 and they say, I'm ready for that. And the other half of the room still thinks it's 1930 and they wanna talk about uh, how, how this is a gateway to uh, heroin and other drugs. So, so you literally are having that conversation simultaneously in the room. But if you, as a good corporate citizen, just like you would do with any other product that was controversial, you've got to walk in the room and say, I don't judge any of you for your views. That's number one. I'm here to help see if we can strike a partnership. So we were able to do that in neighborhoods with restrictions. As a matter of fact, with Lodo's, Lodo Business District is a perfect example. When we went to go meet with Lodo Business District right away. I pulled their marketing document and said, okay, here are the things we can do, and here are the things we can't do. However, we're still going to buy the second to biggest 
uh, sponsorship to be in our business relationship to be inside the Lodo Business District because to us it's important to demonstrate that corporate citizenship. Even though we can't reap a lot of those benefits, that's okay because we're going to throw galas and we're going to do a million other things. So the point is that I think you've got to come in and have that open dialogue with people and just recognize that, you know, like we're doing, you've got to get to the community and the community can come to us as well. Don't be afraid to come in and ask. Can you come in, like you're someone in this room and you're considering marijuana, we, we can be good corporate citizens, we can sit down with your team and help everybody get their questions answered. That's the key. It doesn't have to be something you sneak in or slide in or, or that is super controversial, we can just come in and talk about it. So that's stuff we're already doing. Neighborhood is key, nonprofits are key, and for our organization, finding ways to get creative in a way that a nonprofit didn't even see was possible. You know, and I've, I've had that happen numerous times with those gala type events. Oh, I didn't know you could sponsor the press club dinner. Absolutely you can, because it's inside and contained. So we're able, to, we're able to have some fun and flexibility and we're doing that today. It's so important that we're willing to have dialogue. There are creative solutions. Legalizing at the state level was a creative solution. This, is, this has been a battle going on for almost a century to get cannabis legalized. The way that we're going around the, the federal government's control on this was a creative solution. Colorado took a first step, and, and us as local companies connecting with our communities at the neighborhood level, at the city level, I mean some 70 plus percent of municipalities in Colorado don't even allow recreational marijuana. So we do have a little bit of a divide there, and, and, and as corporate citizens, we are continuing the conversation. We are good businesses. This industry is employing tens of thousands of people. Is it just a coincidence that we have the lowest unemployment rate in the United States in Colorado? So there is real, like when the rubber meets the road, we are contributing to the economic revitalization of our state. And nonprofits do such essential work, making sure that people don't get left behind as corporate citizens, and I mean, I don't even really like the word corporate, dressed down a little bit, but I don't even really like the idea of us versus them. We are all citizens of the state, and us as business people, we want to make sure that the good that we can do, we are doing, and organizations like Kevin's and dispensaries are, are poised to make big changes. There's a lot of movement that we can do, and as this thing rolls out nationally, uh, I think, once again, I'll get back to it, I think first movers really have the advantage. So uh, please do come and reach out to us, and we will do the same. It's, it's definitely an, uh, you know, it's, it's an extended handshake from us. As corporate citizens, we want to make sure that we're doing our part and uh, getting rid of any stigma that does remain. It, it should, and, and Todd mentioned it too, it should match your mission. Um, if you're accepting a cannabis industry, if you're accepting cannabis industry money, and it's in any way, like he, he mentioned, farming, um, you know, the use of pesticides and things like that. If cannabis is in relation to your organization in any way like that, you need to take that into account because how are donors, um, current donors and future donors, going to look at your organization if you're accepting money from that particular um, uh, cannabis industry or cannabis industry partner? Another thing to think about is board membership. So what does your board think? You definitely have to go through your board in order to determine whether you are gonna accept cannabis money. And it's really important to get their feedback. I'm not saying that they're gonna be right, I'm not saying that they're gonna be wrong, but you definitely need their feedback. Um, another thing to take into consideration is potential loss of donorship. So if you have donors that are, uh, and I'm gonna use this, but if they're on the older side and they are not cannabis friendly, you might lose some big donors. So you need to weigh whether the acceptance of perhaps a $75,000 sponsorship to an event or something like that is gonna impact your organization over the long run with a loss of larger uh, potential, larger sponsors that you already have. So these are all things that you should take into consideration. You should develop a policy just like you would anything that could be potentially controversial um, and determine and put all that in writing so that your future board um, future leader, whoever that is, um, takes into account what your policy is on the cannabis industry. Michelle, do you have any, is there anything that you went through as a 501c3 to help you determine whether you accept cannabis money? Yeah, actually I have a lot to add here. Um, 
So do your due diligence um, in the beginning days when we um, started accepting um, funds from uh, cannabis and hemp industry, we were actually contacted by a bunch of CBD companies that were on the FDA's naughty list of like, you're not supposed to be able to sell CBD because your CBD products have zero CBD in them and you're basically selling snake oil. And they're like, we'll give you two and a half thousand dollars and we'll sponsor this thing and then you go and look at it and you're like, wow, um, <laughs> I don't think you guys should be in business at all. And it's, um, you know, sometimes you're hungry for funds, but you really have to look at who's providing it. Um, another one is really image. Um, there are some cannabis companies out uh, there, um, not so much in Colorado, but in California, you have a very different culture around cannabis. And there were some um, companies that were maybe a little bit misogynistic, you know, had like the bikini babes um, with their brands. And as a, a nonprofit supporting women's health, that is not a match whatsoever um, and would really, you know, make our, our uh, members and our, our clients um, really uncomfortable. Um, and then the other thing is that there is a difference between, I would say, recreational cannabis and um, medical cannabis. And for um, a group that is really focusing on medical research, it's really hard for us to be like, cool, um, a company that makes dab rigs or something that doesn't quite jive with a medical image um, work with our nonprofit. And so while we're trying to make sure that we have our mainstream uh, sponsors and supporters happy, I don't think that they would be happy sitting side by side like with logos from very, very recreational um, uh, types of brands. And so we, we, really, we really do work to try to figure out what makes like the best team and like family and that makes everyone happy at the end of the day, whether it's our clients or sponsors, um, just that everyone is really on the same page with values and mission. And I think um, never ever steer away from your culture, make sure that your culture within your nonprofit that you see those same aspects of the culture in the um, in the cannabis brands that you might be seeking funding from. Awesome. So we have a couple more minutes. So we will actually do. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Okay. Um, in two fifteen, what's the what's the estimate of the amount of money that the cannabis industry uh, provided to non for profit organizations in the state of Colorado? In 2015? 2015, I'm easy. Yeah, I don't know what the, I don't know how we would tally the total number, because given all the companies do it privately. Yeah, so, yeah, it would hardly even be written down. I don't even know where it would be our total. Well, and that takes me to the, the, the issue of image. The industry is, is making child-proof containers. Uh, that's where your image is. So there are two, just, just to kind of help you frame it, um, by the way, I should also note that politicians are taking marijuana money in large numbers on both sides of the aisle and everywhere in between. So don't think that uh, that that's, that's they that take not already happens and they flush it. So. Yeah, right. So I, I think I think though to frame what you're saying, I think part of it is the industry is bound by certain rules in this state, um, which is part of why you don't always see it. So for example we can't go on a national sponsorship run. Even with Grow for Vets, which I've also done some stuff with, um, you have to be very careful. How are they advertising? How are they promoting? It can all link back to your license. So I think that's part of why you haven't heard a lot about it, because it is very difficult to navigate the regulatory structure and make sure you get it just right. Now, when you do get it right, it's magic. And the one loophole that is consistent for all of you who have nonprofits and want to team up with marijuana is the media is exempt from those rules. So if there is a CNBC story about something the marijuana industry just did with a charitable organization that is free reign in the media, as long as it is not an advert, a paid advertising. So, so that, so, it's so I, relations. Exactly, and, and I, I wish we could measure it better, because I think you'd, I think we would all be surprised at how much is being given, but I think they're without tax, I mean, with this, this is but a there's real an industry association, is it not Colorado? There are several, yes, and I would argue that they don't all coalesce very well. So it's it, that's why you see companies, in, I don't know what the floor, your florist plan is, but certainly Green Solution, we've moved ourselves sort of in a bit of a silo away from those groups because there's a ton of reputational risk involved in that that we want to manage. So we want to make sure 
We only pull in a partner that we can trust and work with and, and, uh, and, and we want to be very careful, like you were saying as well. So we want to work within that framework. Getting it reported though, that's going to have to be a tax change. I mean, that's, that's going to be the main mechanism. Um, my question is, so I have a nonprofit for cancer survivors, so a lot of, Good the majority you. of the people that we have come. So we have people that come from across the country to camps here in Colorado. My question is, probably a tax question, one of our biggest funder uh, donors receives money from federal. And then they in turn donate to us. Is that an issue that would get them in trouble or us in trouble? I mean, it's University of Colorado. So they're, you know, they receive federal money and they're one of our biggest sponsors from the Cancer Center for what we do. And That's I know we've be, had a conversation. Thank God there's an attorney up here is all I'm saying. <laughs> I, know. I know, and it might be too big of a question. And I've talked to University of Colorado because they want to receive the money too. But, sure, sure, yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Okay. Yes. I mean, it's a I would I would like to jump in here. Um, we have received grants from organizations that receive federal funding, uh -huh. and they know exactly what we're spending it on. Right. Um, so it's it ends up being like a institution by institution, like risk management type per of thing. Case basis. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's a it's a hard one. Um, how how many institutions have actually been gone after? I think by like say the IRS or by the government. I, I don't have too many cases here. And so I think it's like when it's aligned with a good cause, especially like cancer, um, we would receive funding from the Colorado Cancer Coalition. So, um, and so it's just like, you know, that that's one of those things where if it's really for a good vetted cause, I feel like not too many people are gonna poke the sleeping bear and it's And probably okay. like what we do are camps for survivors and yeah. that's what University of Colorado sponsors mm -hmm. is yeah. that. So maybe I could go to a cannabis group and say we well, use sponsor our employees mm -hmm. so then there's no mm -hmm. but, but this issue tends to favor smaller charities who are more able to move and decide that they will accept the risk right. on their own. it's right. a very interesting thing because it's a market distortion right you know we won't we won't act how we would act if right. we had taxes or if we had free reign right but uh, it's an opportunity too for smaller charities or maybe for a couple small charities to band together mm -hmm. and then we really get into the neighborhood level yeah. that really local giving back of our community right. it's nice and, you, and you, bring up, you bring up the point that I was going to make just something to be pay attention to that make sure that everyone involved understands what kind of media play this can get Right. In 2014, if we sent out a press release, the CNN would be on our front door. Right. It's not that bad anymore. However, if it's something unique and really special, like right now we're working on an impairment day with a beer company, a cell phone company, and a local sheriff's department, where people are going to be impaired driving and, and, and scientifically monitored. But we have to be, it's going to take us months to pull it off right. because it's all got to be perfect. And we had to ask everybody involved, are you sure you want the media there. And they said, oh yeah, yeah, sure, just local media. I'm like, I don't think you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. A beer company, a cannabis company, and a telephone company are about to say all impairment is bad in unison while holding hands. That's a national story. Yeah. Because impairment is a critical thing, right? So had we not said that in that way, they would have just fired off and it would have been a ma could have been a massive problem. So now they're really analyzing, do they want the media there? Do they not? Or overturn cases? You know, it starts to it starts to have this nuance right. to it. Right. So you go back to your board and say, "Are you sure we want to have media? Because there's a potential for that." Uh, like if you called me tomorrow and wanted me to be a part of that, I'd be like, "I want to be a part of that." But I'm bringing my mother, who lives in Ohio, who grew weed illegally and and survived cancer, and I want her there, and I want CNN to come in. You're gonna go. I'm not sure we're ready Maybe for that. Not. Or you did. <laughs> we were having this or discussion. By the way, it's an election year too, so get your politicians to your events with yeah. cannabis. It helps yeah. more. But if you do, if you do pull it off, you could never pay for the exposure that you could. Oh, it's yeah. tremendous. Which is what's yeah. really exciting, if 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 you're ready for that. Yeah. I want to thank you all again for coming. Um, just in relation to public image, so Can It Make a Difference Day is uh, September 20th. And our goal is to raise $4.2 million. 
Um, that money will flow through the Doing Good Foundation and be distributed throughout Colorado to nonprofits through a committee of um, uh, cannabis leaders, uh, can cannabis industry leaders, hopefully state government, uh, local philanthropists, and uh, leaders in the nonprofit sector. September what? September 20th. It's one day of giving. It's uh, if we can raise $4.2 million in relation to Colorado Gives Day, we can say the cannabis industry and their consumers account for 10% of giving in relation to um, in the number. state of Colorado. Hmm? There's your so, number you want. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to thank our, our, uh, our panelists so much for coming. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. Um, I know we're butted up against the last session of the day, but thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. And you guys for coming. Thank you. Do you have any questions? I wake up every morning to the smell of my neighbor's grass. I try to put it out of my mind while I rush to get the kids ready for school, but they complain about the smell too. It follows us everywhere. They smell it at school, in every classroom, when they go outside for recess, and when they walk home. Nobody's studied the effect of smelling marijuana over a long period of time, so we don't really know what it's doing to our kids. Heck, I smell like it when I ride the bus, when I'm at work, and when I'm shopping for groceries. When people smell it on me, they just assume I'm a user or I'm from that neighborhood. <laughs> that neighborhood. That neighborhood used to have a sense of community that we took pride in. Before the grass took over our neighborhood, kids could play at the park till dusk and everyone felt safe to walk the streets at night. But the grass found it easy to grow in my neighborhood. It dug its roots in deep and started to break apart the foundation of the community. Having so many marijuana dispensaries and grow facilities in our neighborhood has changed how the youth view marijuana. It's normalized drug use. We hear stories of people using marijuana as medicine in El Seminario, but what we see is people using it to escape responsibilities. Parents are smoking on the front porch right in front of their kids. These same kids will steal the marijuana from their parents to sell at school. Then they're categorized as at-risk youth, which just adds another hurdle for them to overcome. Then we have the problem of displacement, where the marijuana industry is taking over so much of the neighborhood, families are being forced out. Gloria, who had lived here for 30 years, is being uprooted and forced out of her home to make room for this grass. For the first time in decades, our neighborhood had value to outsiders, which meant my family and I were treated like weeds. Buildings could be bought with cash, and the rent for them doubled in a month. The apartment building across the street that housed 15 families was knocked down to make room for another marijuana grow facility. Residents are only given a 21-day notice when their building is sold. All this money is being brought into my hometown, but none of it's going to help the residents. El Seminario reported about the marijuana industry making millions of dollars from the dispensaries in my neighborhood, but I don't see any of that money coming back. Are we being taken advantage of because the public officials only listen to people with money? Is it the color of our skin? Or is it because we live in that neighborhood? Need a man.